you all so much for joining us for Codes and Ciphers in the American Revolutionary War with historic New England's Gail White Usher. Codes, ciphers, and all manners of methods have been used for hundreds of years to secretly send messages. This program explores some of the devices and codes that were used during the American Revolutionary War, as well as the spies that utilized them. Uh, this presentation is led by Gail White Usher, who's an educator and researcher working in New England's early history. She is currently the education coordinator for Historic New England at Roseland Cottage in Woodstock, Connecticut. Gail is also president of the Woodstock Historical Society and chair of the Woodstock Historic District Commission. Uh, so all 70 of us or so uh, right now, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Gail for joining us today. And Gail, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very, very much. And it's a pleasure, Robert, to be back here in Tewksbury um, with you and to be in this week before the holidays, the Christmas holiday, um, to, be, to, to be participating. I'm going to share my screen and get us going. Um, and let's see if I can get rid of, oops, there we go. All right, um, and I hope you have pencil and paper um, because I'm gonna put you to work a little bit later in the presentation. I'm uh, seeing if you can, um, let's see if you can, you can manage to understand and work in uh, one of the more complicated codes that was developed during the Revolutionary War. Um, now, humans have been attempting to create ways to communicate in secret ever since the need arose to send messages that could only be understood by the sender and the receiver. Early methods. Um, around the world use signal fires. Some of the simplest methods use devices as in the Lexington Alarm. Even before the first shots at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, Paul Revere had a private code system in place, a visual signaling system. As, as many of you know, Revere arranged to use two lanterns in Boston's North Church to send a signal. Seeing the lamps across the bay, his compatriots in Charlestown knew that the British regulars were crossing over the back bay and sent out riders to warn Sam Adams and John Hancock. The signal, understood only by Revere and his friends, was in place in case Revere would be unable to cross the water himself to give warning. And I know many of us are learned in, our, in elementary school, Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, which begins, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be. The lantern in this case was the signaling device. Now messages could be hidden in ordinary objects. Nathan Hale, a Connecticut spy, hid secret papers in his shoe. Unfortunately, they were quickly discovered when he was captured. British General Howe sent a secret message inside the quill of a feather pen. And the quill is the hard um, section of the feather that attaches to the bird. Now, it's hollow, which is where, where when you use it to write, ink is drawn up into that hollow. Well, Howe used a much dirty, much ink-stained feather pen as a vehicle for sending his message. He wrote, and this is, a, this is the exact message that has survived from the Revolutionary War, um, how Took wrote in extraordinarily small handwriting, wrote out his message to General Burgoyne, informing Burgoyne that Howe would be invading Pennsylvania. And he rolled it finely enough to be able to insert it into the ink-stained quill. The tiny message was not easily detected. The ink on the outside of the quill pen completely obscured the message inside, and the message was safely delivered to Burgoyne. It survived and is in the William Clements Library at the University of Michigan. It's remarkable and in many respects, it's so simple 
uh, an object, a common everyday feather pen would be the vehicle for sending this message. Now, women and children frequently carried information and messages on their persons. In the 18th century, um, it was common conduct, the codes of conduct um, said that a man would not usually physically touch or search a woman that was not, who was not his wife, would not search um, a child. So women who, and women who traveled were not usually challenged or stopped in their travels, um, or prevented from traveling. In fact, women frequently use the ruse of, of going to visit relatives to be able to cross over enemy lines. So maps and documents were sewn into their garments. Um, they, were, they were secreted in, within the diapers of babies or carried close to women's bodies you know, as a way to convey them um, on. One woman, um, Anna Smith Strong on Long Island, provided information about the movement of British troops in Long Island Sound to Washington using her laundry. Now, Anna Strong was part of the Culpeper Spy Ring, which is a very, a much, very notorious and successful um, American spy ring that operated in Connecticut and New York all around Long Island Sound. Um, there were, uh, some, some believe, as many as 26 principal members of this ring. And in this case, what Anna, Anna Strong's contribution was to hang differently colored laundry on her washing line in different orders to show the movements of the British ships on Long Island Sound. Invisible inks were used for written messages. The messages could only be revealed when the paper was held up to heat or light or a liquid was poured over it. And perhaps as children, um, you experimented with writing with either lemon juice or onion juice. When the juice dries, it's invisible. When the paper is placed over heat, in the case of the Revolutionary War period, over a flame, then the heat burns the juice and, on the paper and makes it visible again. And the way this would work in, in writing messages was that the writer wrote a regular letter and then wrote the secret messages, message in invisible in either lemon juice or onion juice in the spaces between the lines. And then the recipient, knowing that the letter contained a secret message, just held it up to the candle flame to be able to read the message. Now, there were many devices that were used to obscure messages, masks, were one type of device that were very common during the Revolutionary War, used to hide messages. Um, this is a, a template. Uh, masks were really just cut out shapes, shapes cut out of pieces of paper. Um, in this case, uh, this one from the Clemens Library is an hourglass shape. The, in, in the process, what you do is you put the template, the cutout, over a piece of plain paper and you write the message that you're trying to send within the boundaries, within, the, the sh within this cutout shape. Then you remove the template and you fill up the remainder of the, of the paper. You write, um, write a letter that incorporates the words that are in your message, but is not related to your message. So what you end up with is a letter and embedded within it is the message you're, trying, you're, you're attempting to send. So in this, in the, the example here, which is a message written about General Howe's movements, um, what we've done is highlighted the secret message the, within the text, within the body of the larger letter. The receiver would have the identical template, the identical cutout or mask on their end, and they would know um, they would they would know which mask was used for the particular letter their message they're receiving, and then just by placing their mask on top of the letter, 
then the message itself, the secret message, is revealed. And it could be all kinds of shapes. Um, all kinds of shapes were employed. Now, ciphers and codes, cryptography, change messages into something unintelligible by the use of keys and lists. Ciphers rearrange letters or change individual letters into a different letter, a symbol, or a number based on a prearranged setting known as a key. Codes change entire words or phrases into other words, into number groups, or symbols, again, based on a key. To decrypt a secret message, the receiver needs access to the original key. That's critical. Without the key, you can't decode the message. So theoretically, someone who intercepts the message would not have the key and would therefore not be able to understand the message. Solving mess a message without a key, cryptanalysis, has been a science employed by people, governments, and groups for as long as the cryptography has been used to make messages secret. At the beginning of the Revolutionary War, George Washington made up his own simple substitution code. He substituted symbols for letters of the alphabet. And he used, he, but he used it only for a short period of time. It's a simple substitution. Um, there were no twists um, to it to make it a little more complicated. And so it was pretty quickly deciphered, especially when Washington sent a uh, text with a larger volume of text, a uh, longer message, a longer letter. Um, and so he had to abandon it because it was deciphered and, and began to try to develop more complicated codes to use for sending his messages secretly. Think of a, solving a substitution code as a little bit like Wordle, um, and those of you who play, who play that game, um, that is, you are looking for common letters. So if you had a large, a large block of text, you would notice, for example, that there might be a lot of, quite in this case of Washington's code, there might be a lot of question marks showing up or um, the what looks like a minus sign or circles, um, those, those letters that are com more commonly used. And by process of elimination, you would begin to be able to figure out Washington's code. Substitution codes are, are really also could involve substitution alphabets. And this is a simple example of a substitution alphabet where you create a second alphabet um, that represents the original alphabet. So in this case, what we've got is an A, a regular A alphabet, A through Z, and we are substituting it for it, um, an, an alphabet that begins with the letter M. So A is represented by M, B becomes N, C, O, D, P. Simple substitution all the way around, down to Z becoming L. So in the case of a word, simple word like river, then it's merely a manner, a matter of, of replacing each letter with its second alphabet's cognate. An R in this case, in the M alphabet is D, I in the M alphabet is U, V in the M alphabet is H, E is Q, and R again is D. So river, coded using the M alphabet, simple substitution, becomes D-U-H-Q-D. And again, just like the case of Washington's simple symbol substitution code, this one is easily, um, easily solved. You just need a large enough body of text to begin to identify commonly used letters. And in process of elimination, you're able to um, solve the particular code. Thomas Jefferson, 
used a, a, a cipher, a wheel cipher. Um, and a wheel cipher is an interesting device. Um, this, in, the particular one that Jefferson used had up to 36 individual disks and you can see these disks and they're mounted on a spindle. And each disk has all of the letters of the alphabet on it. I'm going to move to a simpler version of Jefferson's wheel. All right. So each disk contains in random order, all of the letters of the alphabet. To use the disk, the, the cipher wheel, to um, create a coded message, what you do is you take one line and you write your message, you pick the letters to write your message in English in the using the regular alphabet. Um, so, and, and so what you end up with is one line that has an intelligible, readable message. All the other lines are just a, what appear to be just a, a, an amalgamation of letters, just a hodgepodge of letters. Uh, and you send the message in, you pick one of the lines that is not using the regular alphabet and you send that message. The receiver has the same sized wheel, cipher wheel, and they set their all of their rings, all the disks, to read the message that you sent, to create the line that you sent. And then they rotate the wheel until they come to a line that makes sense, that is readable. And that gives them the message. It was a good method. It was a good cryptography tool to encrypt a message. Um, not always 100% accurate. You know, these are wooden wheels. And as you can see, just with this one, miss a certain amount of misalignment. Um, and you might accidentally end up with a line that happened to make some sense, but wasn't, ex wasn't the actual message. Um, Jefferson encountered problems using this because his wheel had up to 36 disks. It made it cumbersome. Uh, the person on the receiver had to make sure they were using the same number of disks that he was using. Uh, messages passed slowly, especially he used this for, uh, in some instances to send messages to France. It took a long time to get information back and forth. Um, and so this method tended to break down. He attempted to, he tried to use it for throughout the Revolutionary War and into the early 1800s, but eventually got so frustrated with um, the, the, the ease and the success of doing this that he abandoned it in the early 1800s. Now, George Washington, in his continuing attempts to create an unbreakable, to, to create a code system that could not be solved, tasked James Lovell to create an unbreakable code system that the American troops could use and use consistently. And Lovell successfully created what we know as Lovell's code. It, is, it was so good that it remained unbreakable until World War II. And this, uh, this, is a, this is a page from Lovell's code book. So Lovell's code is a multi, multiple substitution code with twists. Um, it's not a straight substitution code. He threw a couple of extra variables in to make this very complicated code. It basically, it used a different code word every day to create a minimum of two alphabets used to encipher words. Then it used a combination of numbers to encrypt the enciphered letters in the message. The recipient needed to know the code word for the day that the message was created 
in order to encipher the message. And they also knew how, needed to know how to use the code. One of Lovell's twists was that he changed the code words every single week. So never they were never the same. So we're gonna learn Lovell's code. Now this is where you need your pencils and paper. And we will go through this bit by bit. And perhaps this is something that you'll have fun sharing with uh, younger members of your family over the holidays. Um, and Lowell, as an example, was a Massachusetts representative to Congress. So he was, he just happened to have a really particular skill in, in, um, in cryptography. Um, and Lovell's system was used when John Adams and Ben Franklin were corresponding back and with each other and when they were corresponding back with George Washington. In Lovell's cipher, each recipient, each correspondent is given the key word to use to turn the message into code or, and to decode the message. Um, and again, as I said, that key word is changed those keyword, that keyword is changed every day of the week and the group of keywords for the week are changed weekly. So the first thing you're gonna need to do is make a column of numbers one through 30 on your paper. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that and then um, we'll get and let's see, Robert, perhaps you can monitor to let me know if most everybody has, you think most everybody has gotten their one through 30 done. I hope so, Gail. <laughs> All um, right, so, sure. so if you've got one through 30 listed, now what we're gonna do, um, we're, the code word we're going to use, the keyword we're going to use to create our multiple alphabets is the word cranch, which was what John, one of John Adams's keywords. It happened to be the last name of his brother-in-law, Robert Cranch. The reason we're doing, and so we're, let's see, I'll back up. So we're going to create a C alphabet and an R alphabet, two substitution alphabets. The reason we do, are doing 30 the number is 30. Even though the alphabet contains 26 letters, Lovell added the ampersand, the and symbol, into his code. And he also offered added three blanks, three fake letters into his code. So if I was if I was doing an A alphabet, it would be A through Z, letter 27, number 27 would be the ampersand sign, 28, 29, and 30 would be the null or blanks or fake letters. Next to number one, um, you're going to make create a C alphabet, and a C alphabet just begins with the letter C, goes straight in order all the way through to Z. So um, one is C, two is D, three is E, four F, all the way down. You should end up with number 24 corresponds to the letter Z. Then after Z, 25 will be the and sign. And then, then you end up 26 and 27 are A and B because they were the, they're the last two letters that, aren't in, that weren't in your C alphabet. 28, 29, and 30 are the blanks. I'll give you a couple minutes to create your C alphabet.
And if you've got your C alphabet done, then you're going to create next to it a, an alphabet that begins with R. This is the second letter of the keyword cranch. And so in this case, you start the alphabet, not with A or C, you start the alphabet with R, go through Z. So number nine would corresponds to the letter Z, followed by the and sign at number 10, and then A, number 11, all the way through until you get to the last letter of your R alphabet, which is Q, number 27, and then 28, 29, and 30, again, are blank, blank, blank. And the end result of all of this is you've got three columns, one numerical, one through 30. The second middle column is the C alphabet plus the and sign and three blanks. And the third column is the R alphabet with the, with the and symbol and the three blanks. And you can see where if every time you change the keyword, um, then you are creating a whole new set of substitution alphabets. And so that's that's it, that's complicated enough. Um, you know, by changing the keyword every day, then your mess H message you send is will be even if you sent the same message every day, it would look different because you'd be using different alphabets. But Level, level took it, uh, more, added more steps to this. Instead of sending a message in letters, each letter of his message was assigned, was sent as the number, its number. So if he was sending a message that said, um, uh, let's see, said call, for example, then he would start it with the number one and he was using the C alphabet. It would be one, 26, 10, 10. Or if he was using the R alphabet, it would be 13, 11, 2222. But Lovell wasn't satisfied with that. Instead, what he decided to do was this is his first real twist um, that when he's writing a message in code, he takes the first letter of the message. Uh, so if we're using the word call, the first letter is going to be using the C alphabet. So in this case, the first letter with a number, its corresponding number would be one. But the second letter of, the of, of his message, he's gonna draw from the second alphabet. In this case, the R alphabet. So, this, so the letter A, with the second letter in call, would be number 11. And for the third letter, L, he's going to go back and use the first alphabet, which puts it back at 10. And then the fourth letter is going to be the second alphabet, which makes it 22. We're going to move on just a bit. Now, keep, your, keep your alphabets handy. So here's an, ex here's an example of that, the word Benedict using the C and R alphabets is encrypted to 27, 15, 12, 15, 2, 19, 1, and 13. And this is the way Lovell would send it. A period after each number 
27. The number 27 comes from the first alphabet. The number 15, the second letter of the word, comes from the second alphabet. The third letter of the word, back to using the first substitute substitution alphabet. The fourth letter, the second substitution alphabet. The fifth letter, the first substitution alphabet, and so on through the word. But Lovell still wasn't satisfied. He still feared that that could be could be um, hacked, to use a modern term, could be solved. So then Lovell added blanks to the word. And this so this is another option for enciphering the word Benedict. We've got the 27 for B, 15 for E, 12 for N, all right, the same as the first way, C alphabet, R alphabet, C alphabet. But then he threw in a blank, a fake letter. And that changes the order of the alphabets because this blank letter then forces the actual fourth letter of the word to now come from the, I have to go back myself and check to make sure I'm right on this, from the first alphabet. It changes the order of the alphabets um, you're, you're drawing from. And so it makes an entirely different code, co encrypted word sequence, number sequence, just because you added the blank. And I'm gonna pause here and let people ask questions. So if folks have any questions for Gail, they can get them into the Q&A. Uh, I think some of the questions that have already been asked, you, you sort of answered. Um, Judy asks, is there a book on Washington's ciphers? Um, there, there are, the best one is the Washington's, is, you can Google Washington's code and we can send, I can send you a copy of Washington's code as well, um, Rob, so that you can send it out to anybody who's interested. Uh, there are some of the ciphers he used are um, known, but many of them are not. And he ended up using, Lovell's code was, was developed about the middle of the Revolutionary War. And this was used because it was unbreakable. This was used by Washington for the rest of the war and by the American army. Um, so what I wanted to do is give us a chance to do a little practice with this, just to see how you are, how you, how you are with the code. So I'm going to go back to our alphabet and still. Gail, can I, can, Gail, can I ask one more question though? I don't want to, I don't want to sure. break your flow, but um, a couple people are asking a similar question. How did people know the code word? How, how did they know? And maybe you addressed this and I missed it, but how, how did they, how did they know what the, you know, where to, where to start the alphabet. So Lovell, um, Lovell used books as a, as a matter of fact, as, um, so everybody who was involved in this, who would be sending and receiving in this particular um, system, using this system was given the same book. Uh, a, a reader, a, uh, some, a psalm book, some phrases, a uh, book with um, some of the, of the chapters of the Bible, for example, a commonly available book. And Lovell would have worked out and let everybody know that on the week of January 1st, for example, um, he would give them page, he would give them a number code that indicated the page of the book, the line of the book, of the line on that page and the specific word on that page 
um, the specific letter on that in that line that would represent the that would help it, that would be the word that was going to be the code word. Um, and they they had this with them, this this um, lengthy this key that would provide them with the information that they would need for many weeks of what the code words were each week. Hmm. And so in that way, they were all operating with the same information. Lovell didn't change the, or Washington didn't, they didn't change, randomly change. Um, their spy ring had all of the information up front when they went off, they all were operating under the same, inf with the same information about what the week of January 1st, what the code word was gonna be. They And it was embedded within these books, the common books that they carried. Uh, so they would know what January 1st, for example, code word was and, and then January 8th. And so different sequence of numbers pointed them to a specific word in a book that was going to be the code word. And All right, it, was, well, we, we, it was a really pretty, it was a really good system because it was complicated enough yes. that it was not easy. Um, you couldn't, you, anybody intercepting messages would never, ever get consistency in it. Uh, Eva asks, uh, were there ever times where the recipient failed to decode the message? <laughs> yes. Yes, you could lose the book. The page got wet um, that gave you the information about what the code word was. Um, yes, they were they were frequently times that recipients had either failed or had trouble decoding the messages. In fact, Adams and Ben Franklin both had trouble decoding messages and they complained vigorously throughout the course of the Revolutionary War that they couldn't read their secret dispatches. Um, so it was a it was a consistent and common complaint. Lovell's specific spy ring had seemed to, aside from losing a book um, or having a page get damaged, um, seemed to be able to keep up. But it was some of the diplomats like Adams and, and Franklin who were uh, less, let's see, less experienced, perhaps, um, who, or had more on their minds, maybe we should say that, um, who, who had trouble. And, but they are both recorded as, as complaining vigorously about the difficulty of reading their dispatches. And I can imagine that they both assigned aides to have to deal with the encryption and decryption. So Gail, I'll, we'll do one more question, then we'll move on. And I promise we'll get to all the other questions at the end. Uh, Rochelle asks, wouldn't it be safer to alter the nulls uh, locations as is done with the letters of the alphabet? We know that 28, 29, and 30 are always nulls. Isn't that a clue to the code breaker? It would be. Evidently, it wasn't. Um, and and you're right. I, it struck me as odd that that Lovell consistently assigned the 28, 29, and 30 as nulls, but um, but he, he did not change that. That was one of the one of the consistencies in his code. Um, and it's possible that over time, one if if one intercepted a large body of messages all encrypted with the same code alphabets um, with the same using the same key that that you would find you would get that consistency and you would you would decide to just um, negate you know a, pr eliminate the 28 29 and 30s but you still left with alphabets that are um, changing on a daily basis. So evidently it was sophisticated and difficult enough that, as I said, it took the Enigma machine in World War II to crack the code. All right, Gail, uh, we can move on to more fun and games. <laughs> so this is just, a, just to give you a little bit of practice. Um, I thought you might, you know, we'll pick a word, um, uh, just pick a word, we'll take a word and just give you a chance to, um, to try and, and work it out. So a simple word like Cooper, 
uh, C-O-O-P-E-R is a good word to, to practice with and are going to use the same um, CNR alphabets to, to turn the word Cooper into code. So just take a couple of minutes and see if, just to see if that makes, if the workings of it makes sense, because I want you all to be comfortable using these alphabets and then go out and um, wow your kids or your grandkids or the, you know, your friends and neighbors um, with your ability to make complex codes. And Gail, you want us to bounce back and forth between the C and the R? The... I'm back. Yes, you're going to use Lovell's, Lovell's, alpha, Lovell's code and using the C and the R alphabets. Okay. So folks, uh, how are we doing? Do we think we're uh, think we're good? So if someone would like to type in what they have for the first, and I'll monitor the chat. Someone would like to type in what they've got, 125, 13, 26, 30. That is correct. 125, 13, 26, 3, and 1 is correct. Straight substitution with a twist. Now, let's insert the null or, or blank in as the second letter in the mess in the word Cooper. So it would be C blank O O P E R. And once if someone has the um, the new encryption, they can go ahead and post it in the chat.
Jacqueline says 128, and it could be 29 or 30, 13, 25, 15, 15, 16. Um, Jacqueline, you're off by your third number, third from the end number isn't correct. Elizabeth says 129, 13, 25, 14, 15, 16, and that's correct. That's what I get. So you see, it, it completely changes the, um, the, the encrypted word just by adding that blank in. And we go into practice. Like I said, with, with those twists added to it and the fact that he changed every week, every day started, um, had it was a different keyword. And then at the end of the week, the next following week, completely whole new set of keywords. And then he was able to keep Lovell's code kept ahead of any attempts by the British to be able to, to solve the code. And Washington was satisfied and Adams and, um, and Franklin were frustrated. So, um, and those are just um, two examples. Those are just some examples of the, the, um, the types of codes and a little bit of information about spycraft um, from the Revolutionary War era. So I hope you are able to, um, let's see, wow your friends and neighbors and families with your new code solving ability. You know, by being able to manage Lovell's code, you get, like, as I said, you're, you're working in a code that took, could not be solved until, the, until a machine solved it during World War II. Yes, when we go to all our uh, Christmas and Hanukkah and uh, New Year's uh, parties, we'll uh, we'll be able to impress. Uh, when, they're Dale, look, when they're look, I was going to say when they're looking to ask, looking to you for your party piece, you know what 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 can you do to wow your crowd? Um, well, you could use you could wow the younger generation with Washington's code. That's always a pleaser. It's a simple, easy one. And um, kids have a lot of fun writing using Washington's simple symbol codes, symbol symbol code system. Um, but then uh, you can wow them with uh, with Lovell's code. And so, Gail, are you writing the code? Are are you writing it? Um, are you following the rules for the day you write it, or the day it's going to be received? You follow the rules for the day you write it. So right. the receiver is needs to know that so the needs to know the day it the day the message was written and whether it's it's using a mask for example um be, to to use to to hide your message and embed your message in a letter or whether you're using Lovell's code that the another key piece of information is the day the message was written because there's no way to know when the message could is going to be received yeah, no, that's that that was too vague. Um, uh, it, you're sending a, you know, you're you're walking, you're riding a horse, you're using multiple people to get a message to somebody. You're, it's even has to transit by ship, so there's no way to predict the reception date of that message. All that is all that can be um, nailed down is the creation date of the message. All right, so let's take about 10 minutes of questions here. Uh, Mike says, uh, Lavelle looks like what uh, would be the 1930s rotor system, like the German Enigma or Japan Purple. Is this true? Yes, absolutely. It, it Lovell's code was a, a handwritten way to, to do that. Yep. And JM asks, uh, can you explain more about the Enigma machine uh, that you've referenced several times? The Enigma machine um, is uh, the um, Alan Turing's invention in, um, in encryption device that was developed during in England in World War II. And um, I'm not an expert on that uh, at all, but it, it's based on um, Civil War era cipher enciphering wheels. Um, 
And so you could, that's something you can Google the civil war um, in ciphering wheel, cipher disks and, and which were um, way, uh, and a cipher wheel is a quick and handy way to turn a message into code. Um, it's a handheld device um, and turning built a machine that used hundreds of these cipher wheels that could all work at the same time trying to decode a message or to create code. And his, his goal and initially was to create a machine, basically like our computers now, but a, a, create a machine that could solve a code. Um, and, and so um, it's a fascinating story. Um, there is a movie made of it. Um, so I, I highly recommend that you look for you look into um, the Enigma machine. It's it's an amazing piece of equipment. Uh, Martha says creating the messages would seem to take a lot of time. Were women involved while the men were off fighting? Um, Spycraft was mainly a man's um, in the 18th century. Spycraft was mainly a man's job um, that fell to men. Women were engaged in it, but um, I don't have examples of women creating the codes. And you know, this was war was a man's domain in the 18th century. Uh, Sue asks, are, are only the first two letters of the code word used? No, you could use more. For our purposes, we only use, it's easier for me to teach using just two, but you could use four letters and that would make it, or five letters, that it would just make it that much more complicated. And Jean asks again, uh, what was the significance of the code word we use today? Was it an in-laws name or? Yes, it was the code, the cr word cranch was the last name of um, John Adams is Adams's brother-in-law. Uh, Mike asks, did Jefferson, Franklin or others uh, that spent time at the English or France courts uh, bring back uh, this, this technique? Hopefully I'm saying that right, Mike, I apologize. Did Jefferson, Franklin or others that spent time at the English or France courts bring back techniques? Um, then I don't know. Uh, different ways of, of doing sending coded message. Did they bring back to the United to America different ways of encoding messages? I'm not sure. Um, they may have shared Lovell's code over there but the objective was to they might have shared it with the french that franklin might have shared it with the french certainly that's a possibility uh so ron asks what about the british codes um how how were how were they uh, uh ciphering things and mike wants to know did lavelle decrypt any british messages um i haven't spent as much time on, I haven't spent en enough time to be able on British techniques to be able to really um, to re answer that question about what the British were doing. You know, we know that General Howe was writing a message out in longhand and inserting it into a quill pen to get it, but I'm sure that they were trying, trying some encryption techniques as well. So a good um, avenue for exploration for exploration further. Uh, Eva says, uh, do we know who made Jefferson's wheel? Uh, some members of the Hemings family were skilled carpenters. We don't. There isn't any information on who actually crafted the wheel. Um, as far as I'm able to deter, I've, I've been able to find out, but it's very possible. That's it's yeah, very, it's hard to know. So we're going to take a few more questions. Uh, Judy asks, could or would you email Robert your slides of the ciphers? So I'll leave that up to your decision, Gail. But um, I, I'll, I mean, I mean of the if does she mean of Washington's code? And I, I think this the slide that you showed earlier with the C and the R. Uh, oh, and that went Lovell's code as well. Sure. I I think so. 
Yeah. Um, let me see here. So folks, we're going to start to wind it down. I'm going to, um, Robert, if I just in, interrupt, yeah. I have, a, I have a, a, let's see, an instruction page, a couple of instruction pages printed out about Lovell's code. So I will email you that document and you can share it. And I'll also send you um, the graphic of Washington's code. Well, that would be great, Gail. If you could do that by five, that'd be great, because I'm going to email everyone uh, the uh, recording and the feedback survey. And if I, if I could have the handouts, I could do it all at once. That'd be great. Uh, so, folks, we're going to start to wind it down. Uh, Joyce wants to know, what about the Native American language used for code in World War II? I don't think anyone broke that code. She's correct. She's correct. The code talkers in World War II are, are an under recognized um, and amazed then amazing people who use their own languages to you know enable the sending of messages yep uh, Martha and, and wanted I, to I know also to, I also want to make a correction um, that the Enigma machine was a um, German uh -huh. machine that was used to encrypt messages and that what Turing, Turing did was create a, a British, an allied machine that could decode the messages, that could solve the Enigma machine's encryptions, just to clarify. Yeah, um, Martha wants to, essentially Martha asks, you know, how would they know they broke the code? I, I, I guess, I guess, um, I mean, would it, I guess it would be gibberish if um, you would you would you would think it would, that it would be pretty obvious, you know, once they they figured the code out. Um, yeah, they could consistently read messages. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, Ashley says the Nazis didn't kn didn't know Navajo. Yeah, I I guess that's right. Yeah. Uh, J M asks, and and I lost the context of this, but uh, Hamilton's Hercules McGullen referred to spies on the inside taking information and smuggling it. Um, are, are you familiar with that uh, that person? I am that not. Reference? But yeah. but smugglers, but sm um, there were everybody had spies. Both sides in during yeah. the American Revolution had spies. They were good spies. They were successful spies on both sides. Um, and then there were spies. The, a lot of the spies that we know about were the ones that weren't successful, like Nathan Hale, as a good example, yeah. who bold, brave individuals for volunteering to, you know, find, get information and, and carry it, but didn't have the, the experience necessary to be successful. But spies were everywhere. You could have children were great spies because in the 18th century, adults tended to overlook children. So children playing on a street um, underneath the tavern window would be could potentially where British soldiers were um, could potentially overhear information and then provide it to their uh, parent um, or or a, a, an American soldier. Um, right. Women were were considered to not have the head for war for spying um, for complicated information and so. Um, soldiers were British, both Brit British predominantly, but British and American both could would be often indiscreet um, in terms of the information they were discussing because they they relegated women often to the margins. A woman in a tavern who's uh, waiting on on people in the tavern is is going to be just fade into the background and the British soldiers are going to keep talking and that per woman is gathering information that she has the ability to pass on in the same way children do. So it's, uh, there's, there was a tremendous amount of information gathering happening during the Revolutionary War for, and a lot of it done by, well, by slaves, enslaved people, mm -hmm. servants, women, and children. Uh, so just briefly, uh, Diane uh, corrects uh, me, uh, or well, the previous one of the previous previous commenters uh, saying that the Navajo codes were used against the Japan against Japan, uh, not against the Nazis. 
Uh, and Mike says, a story from World War II said that a German used a tide book as the starting code, and an English code nerd had the same book and recognized the tide format to break the code. Hmm, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we end it there, Gail? And Gail, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap up? No, other than it seems I'm really thrilled that that this Revolutionary War Codes program has sparked so much conversation about the use of codes and ciphers and spycraft in the um, in ensuing decades and ensuing centuries. So, you know, you go from the 18th century and we're we're ending up talking about World War II era and and Civil War era. Um, and um, in just in terms of the the concept of the science behind sending messages. Um, it's it's a very fascinating topic. Um, it's one that gets your head really working hard trying to understand how they did what they did. So it was that's that's fun to see it this this start in the 18th century and you bring it into the modern times. So uh, thank you, uh, Gail. Let's give Gail a big virtual round of applause. Um, look for an email from me later today with a recording, a feedback survey, uh, I guess some handouts, uh, and I hope to get to that to everyone before five. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll wrap it there. Uh, happy Hanukkah to those who are celebrating. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. So thanks so much, Gail. Have a good day. And you all too as well. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yep. Bye-bye.